Thanks, Chris. Um, I think I'm just waiting for my permissions to be updated because I left the room and came back in. So as soon as I can, I will share the Menti, but we can start introducing ourselves, I think. So we're going to introduce ourselves in the order that we spoke on the blog and give you just a little summary of the different perspectives that we are coming from this issue. So we all work in at Manchester Met, but we're in different teams. So we, we have slightly different focuses on what we're looking at, but a lot of our work has overlapped and we've collaborated on a lot of things. So this is a really nice opportunity to come together and just reflect with others who are in this space as well. So Chris, do you want to start by sharing your experience and where you've co you're coming at this from? Yeah, can do. I've uh, put your rights proper as well now, Leanne, so you should be good to go. Um, yeah, so my name is Dr. Chris Lillard. I work in, in the University Teaching Academy um, at Manchester Met University, which is our kind of central academic development unit. And I work very fortunately alongside Catherine and Leanne in two their teams join up with ours as part of a, a centre for learning, learning enhancement and educational development. Um, so the, the kind of approach that I was taking to generative AI as one of the people who sort of found his name out there as someone to speak to, even though I had no expertise in it, um, was really that I had colleagues based in faculties who were asking me about, you know, how do we how do we teach this to students? How do we figure out if they've cheated with it? What do we do? And I was like, I don't know. It's only just come out. Um, <laughs> bear with us on this. Um, and then Leanne and I did a series of, of workshops from sort of December 2022 through to sort of June-ish and we, we continue into this day um, where we were really providing a forum for staff to come and ask questions and share anxieties, share share the bit, bits they were excited about and through that we fed that back into kind of institutional conversations around what a policy would be, what our stance would be and the kind of direction of travel for Manchester Met. Um, so that's me. Thanks, Chris. So um, I was working with Chris on these Let's Talk sessions and something that came up quite a lot was the um, idea of people being quite nervous and anxious about these these tools. They were, were quite unlike the things that people had used before. So um, people would have appreciated a safe space to have a look at those. So my role in the university is in, in the digital education team or the, the learning technology team. And we put on some sessions that we called Let's Explore. So as well as the, um, the Let's Talk sessions, we also had these Let's Explore sessions for staff. And what we've done is explored a range of different tools within those that would come under the, the wider AI banner because the generative AI is getting a lot of attention at the moment. Um, but the term AI is, is wider than that. And there are other things that we're getting a little bit confused with the message with that. So they've been working really well as um, as a companion to the Let's Talk session. So we have regular Let's Talk and Let's Explore sessions between us. Um, but there was also the student side of things as well. So Catherine is going to um, talk to you about that side of things as well. Over to you, Catherine. Thanks, Leanne. Um, yeah, uh, so as I've already said, my name is Catherine Elkin and I'm an experiential learning tutor at Manchester Met and I work within RISE, which is Manchester Met's uh, co-curricular offer. And I lead on the area of sort of digital skills or capabilities. And as Leanne said, um, obviously when gener gener generative AI kind of um, became the central focus for um, a lot of us um, uh, quite a while ago uh, now, um, we decided there was a lot of um, concern over um, how students may use it, um, what they may um, use it for, and we kind of just so our aim for the past year has kind of been to facilitate an open dialogue with students on their perceptions of AI and to provide safe spaces for them to explore the implications of using generative AI. And so I worked with Leanne to uh, run a series of workshops where we would work through some of these uh, considerations and ethical or 
all these other um, things that students should think about when they're using um, AI tools. And we also wanted to empower them to recognize the integration of AI into existing technologies as well, just so um, they were able to um, become confident in using it and the appropriate uses of it. Um, so yeah, thank you, Leanne. Um, it's been uh, it's been a journey and I felt I feel like we've all learned a lot. Um, so I think I'm happy to be here. <laughs> Thanks, Catherine. Yeah, I think a journey is definitely one way to describe this whole situation. It's, it's very fast moving. It, it's quite unlike um, anything we've seen before, really. I think even I always reflect on it in comparison with the pandemic, kind of, because that was kind of urgent, appeared very suddenly needed a big response but we we knew about online learning we knew what the answers were um it was just trying to get all of that that done um whereas this just feels very different so we wanted to give this space to have a discussion around this so if i just go on to the next slide hopefully everybody's able to get on the menti so chris has very helpfully put the link in the chat so please do um, pop the website, so menti.com, into your web browser and put the code in that's on the top of the screen and also in the chat as, as well. And as Chris, Chris said, give us a thumbs up and let us know that you're there. So we, we're not going to talk at you today. We really genuinely want this to be a discussion. So we're using the Menti as a way to get your ideas about different things. And we would also welcome people to to, to come on the microphone, if appropriate, to also share their experiences. So we've done a bit of a welcome and introduction there, but we want to know about your experiences in your institutions. So what kind of things are they doing? How are institutions um, developing critical AI literacies? Um, having a discussion about what works and what doesn't work, and we're going to have a breakout room activity for that and then also um, find, try and find some solutions to this, um, some of the challenges that we're facing as well. Okay, so um, our first question is, um, which generative AI tools have you used? So we're interested to know which tools you have used, and if it's none, that's fine as well, just put none in there we are wanting to know what kind of things you've used so just pop your answer into the menti and then we will um have a bit of a discussion around that and okay, this is thanks. unused as well actually people we're, we're finding there's a lot of colleagues who know a lot about generative ai platforms but have never actually interacted with them themselves so this is a really good chance for us to kind of see what people have actually used um, themselves and there's some on yeah. here i've never heard of which is great <laughs> just thinking that actually <laughs> chat, chat gpt and copilot coming up quite strong yeah um i can see that there's bing co bing copilot as well it's showing a few times on there as well um microsoft are doing some kind of rebrand so everything that was being chat is now becoming copilot so that's that's been quite difficult in managing kind of yeah. guidance and sessions and do you call it bing chat copilot but i'm just going with copilot now because i think it, we've settled on that um when we first started we... mentioning it in our in our webinars with with um colleagues and with students um we we did one for our center for the units that we're involved in and between us deciding on what we were going to present and turning up on the day it was about three days four days something like that they'd rebranded from bing chat to copilot hadn't they so it's it's one of those things that's just constantly changing yeah also, it doesn't help that um it people have different subscriptions to copilot as well and so the different functionality changes according mm. to um what um relationship that they have or the institution has yeah i think for a long time that was quite a challenge with with this wasn't it chris with the um the lack of a institutionally provisioned tool that we felt confident pointing people towards we knew the data was safe yeah. we knew the access <clears throat> was equitable it was quite a challenge wasn't it 
Yeah, and it's interesting that even though we've now got a system that we we have institutional access to that's gone through our vetting that's you know all above board um there's still a lot of people who are sticking to chat gpt you know anecdotally as opposed to moving to the institutionally support one uh, supported one and i think that equity of access point around the subscription-based ones like chat gpt hasn't really gone away um it's just we've got this other convenient lane to go into now um, but some people are still very wedded to particular brands, aren't they, you know? Um, and I think that's going to be a challenge moving forward as well. Yeah. Thank you all for participating in, in that. That's a really nice um, way to, to frame the, the conversation to start with. OK, so if I move on to the next question, then is starting to think about how you feel about generative AI. So um, I've modified what's known as the hype cycle to, to kind of get a feel for this, because I can certainly relate to going through this journey, but not 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 in a linear way, <laughs> back and forth, <laughs> uh, up and down. So the hype cycle has the technology trigger and um, starting you know, down at the bottom and then we get really excited and this is gonna be absolutely amazing. And then we realize that actually it's not quite as good as what we think. And we end up in this trough of disillusionment and then we have the, um, the journey through the slope of enlightenment into the plateau of productivity. And um, if you're not familiar with the hype cycle, hopefully the emojis will work for you instead. So, so pop a pin near the emoji that you can most relate to. Chris, how are you feeling at the moment about AI? I think I'm near point. I'm, I'm sort of just coming down off the top of the, the, the big peak. I think. I think because it, okay. it's it's all accelerating quite a lot now. I was very against it. Not against. I, I don't know. You you'll know it. It depends depends how well my kids have slept but um <laughs> there were points where i was really like this is game changing in a positive way and then there were points where i was just completely exasperated at how suspicious everyone across the sector appeared to be of, of students who we know don't you know by and large don't use things maliciously or cheat maliciously um so i, I found myself fluctuating a lot whereas i feel now that now that it's available to everyone and we're starting to be asked to to find kind of best practice examples of these things and to start supporting our colleagues and our students into using this appropriately, that it's quite exciting. Again, I think I've gone back to being quite excited about it. Yeah, I, I think I'm like, I try and be balanced, but I think I'm equally excited and anxious like at yeah. different times. So it just depends who I'm in the room with, I think, how I, how I come across about um, how enthusiastic I am at the time. It's quite difficult to balance that because some people seem to be very, very enthusiastic about it um, mm. and, and, and others are very terrified by it. So it's about balancing it. Catherine, what about, what about you? How are you feeling at the moment? I feel like I'm similar to you, Leanne, in that I fluctuate between uh, feeling a little bit um, sort of suspicious and really enthusiastic about it and what really um, what really um, decides the mood for me is um, the mood of the students that I talk to um, mm -hmm. because there's some students who are just super enthusiastic and they say I'm going to use this to summarize my articles that I can read so I can uh, be more focused in my research this is an absolute game changer and we just get really you um, you join the hype train um, really whereas there's other students that are really almost um, afraid of talking about it and um, they don't want to um, be accused of cheating or anything like that so they're just not sure how to approach the conversation and so my mood depends on um, the mood of the students who um, want to talk about it really. Yeah and if, I think that's the thing because if somebody is very um, invested in it then I think it's useful to point out well have you thought about the environmental factor. Have you thought about the, the bias issue, particularly with, with staff as well, because it's important for, that they're making informed decisions about, about what they use it for. So um, yeah, it's always about kind of balancing the conversation. Um, Alicia, um, you've put a question in the chat about whether we are referring to anything above the 
um, kind of stuff that comes with Microsoft. We don't pay for anything extra at Manchester Met. We just have the co-pilot, but um, everybody has access to that. I think some people have like technical issues to do with the settings of their browser and things like that, um, but it is available to everyone. Okay, right. Thank you for filling in the um, how you are feeling slide. Um, if anyone wants to give any extra information in, in the chat, please do. We'd be really keen to hear more about um, why you chose a particular place on that cycle. Um, and I'll move to the next question now. So the next thing we'd like to talk about is what we mean by the word critical AI literacy. So if we can kind of work together to pull together the main things that that would cover um so perhaps it's how to use the ai perhaps it's things about the ai that people need to know about Put as many of those onto the, the mentee as you can and we'll be sharing these afterwards as well so hopefully this will become a really helpful resource for everyone in the group i think this is a really important question because it's one of those things that for the past 12 months i've seen yeah. i've seen the phrase critical ai literacy or ai literacy in a lot of webinars shared across the sector and actually no one defines it they just say well obviously we've got to develop ai literacy and then they just move on and then you you know a few months down the line the same institutions the same people are saying we've done all this this amazing work around ai literacy but they still can't define what they mean by an ai mm -hmm. literacy or ai literacy is plural um yeah. <clears throat> So I think it's a really important thing that it doesn't just become a buzzword, that it has proper attributes and characteristics and things that we can, we can, you know, work with. Otherwise it just gives staff who are hesitant and resistant even more of a reason to just not engage. Yeah. Yeah. It's, um, it's tricky, isn't it? It's not just using for me anyway, it's not just about using the tool it's about using them in a appropriate way so sometimes it's it's not appropriate to use them but being able to yeah. articulate why you've decided to um to not use it for this instance is, is just as important as being able to say it is appropriate to be used in this instance i agree yeah with that. And I would also perhaps um, add to that as well, um, the, ab the ability to recognize and evaluate output um, from AI. And I don't just mean generative AI, but as in the recognition of um, all um, AI tools as well. Yeah, yeah, it's because other people are using it for things in the media. Um, there's a whole bunch of things that we're exposed to that's that's been generated AI by AI. And I'm not always sure that we're aware of that sometimes it's really obvious but sometimes it's not i'm thinking pope in the in the puffer jacket it was the um common mm. example wasn't it so we're getting lots of ideas on on here which is great um thank you once we've got a couple more i'm going to use the ai on the mentee to um combine the results to see what it tells us of the main themes on there so um yeah nice examples on there okay right let's have a look at what happens if i do the space bar okay so yeah being able to use ai being aware of the biases being able to evaluate the input the outputs um, and then ethical use as as well and i i also think um it's important to make sure that people are aware of the process of these tools being developed and the environmental and human impact of that as, yeah. as well so that's something that i always talk about isn't it chris yeah and i think i think that environmental issue is something that we often forget about you know the, the environmental cost of running these insane mega giga servers processing all of this data all the time and us using it all the time you know and, and potentially leaning in further to that. It, there's obviously a, a problem with that, um, with what's going on in the world and what's going to continue to go on in, in, with the world. And, and what's been really re refreshing for me to see at Manchester Met is when, um, when students have had opportunities to talk about generative AI, it's not the conversations they have are not what you think they would have. 
you know, or not, but the sector certainly painted them out to be at the beginning of, of this kind of explosion. And actually, students are very concerned about the environmental impact of these things. They're very concerned about the ethical implications of this stuff. Um, and I think in many ways, I've been really heartened by what the students student response to generative AI has actually been on mass, not the, the few that do misuse it. Because I think by and large, I, I would probably, and I'm prepared to kind of die on this hill. I think the students have been far more critical in their reception to generative AI than staff members across the sector as a whole have been. Um, that was my concern when it all first started. That's when I was Mr. Grumpy about this stuff. <laughs> yeah yeah it's, it's hidden a lot though from from the media isn't it so it's um it's, it's tricky because the, the people who are talking about this more widely the sources of of, of information are, are not always given this message as as, as mm. well so i'm quite proud of the fact that in the let's talk sessions we we always do yeah. try to give quite a balanced and holistic view of of the impact of these tools so um yeah thank you so much for all the the points on there i think that's given us a really good starting point for um thinking about critical ai literacy and what we mean by them um okay so next question um thinking about your institution who is involved in developing the critical ai literacies of students so which teams were specifically asking about here so um, is it curriculum teams? Is it the library? Is it um, who is it within the um, institution? Oh yeah, I read um, something by Maha the other day on um, a critical AI literacy framework, and it was very very good. So yeah, that's someone definitely to look out for. Thanks for sharing that, Renee. Um, yeah. So in this question, we're wanting to start thinking about who is involved and we we, we we was quite careful about the wording of this one we didn't want to say responsible because um mm. if, if if there's an institution out there who has a team is responsible for this let us know um mm. because, because we're really keen to hear about that but i think it's it's quite tricky it overlaps with lots of different aspects of the student experience catherine do you want to talk about um kind of some of the things that you've been doing first for, for students in terms of what that looks like perhaps so, hmm. <laughs> um so yeah i'm happy um to talk a little bit more um as i mentioned previously um we um myself and leanne worked together to develop um several workshops um to basically um encourage students to think more critically about the use of AI, not just about um, actually um, evaluating the output, although that is a very um, big, important part of it, but also, um, as Chris mentioned before, the environmental um, implications, the, the issues of bias, the issues of um, copyright and privacy, these are all, um, and even um, legal implications because we're at this stage where technology is kind of outpacing the law quite a, and um, people are just scrambling to catch up and it was really interesting to hear um, students views on it we are also working um on uh, some more resources for students so, um to make sure that we can um agree as an institution what it means to be ai literate because as mentioned before a lot of the time um we, a lot of people can't actually decide what that means. So I'm glad that we are kind of working towards that so that students can um, have a unified source of information and say, okay, this is what it means to be, uh, to be um, literate in AI at Manchester Met. Yeah, I think that's a good example actually to, to explain how we've approached it for, for students. So we're, we're putting together a study pack for students through, through the, the RISE process that everybody will be able to point students to and we've really tried to involve all the teams that would have a stake in this so um we have ai leads in each of the faculties who are who are doing uh, work in this area so we've involved them to get engagement from the academic colleagues we have um staff from the library staff from the um academic study, study skills the career service 
um, we've really tried to pull together all those different teams. So um, they, it would be kind of like a working group. We do have a number of different working groups for, for, for that. And I think there is a lot of overlap in terms of the, the things that people have shared on the mm. Menti there. Um, but also no clear answer to this question yet because it's probably people that I've, I've missed. You know what's really interesting, Leanne, and it's only something that's dawned on me now that I thought of, that I've only been thinking about this while those responses were coming in. And when I think about when we've looked to what other universities are doing, it does seem that this is largely positioned as a, a kind of learning, teaching and academic issue. And mm -hmm. I noticed that on all of those and on ours, we don't involve IT and digital. Or, well, we mm. do, but only as a cursory kind of asking questions. And it, mm. I, I suspect that use of these softwares and these tools will kind of fall into that gap that so many institutions have of who supports students to use software. You know, we yeah. have we have staff members in, in IT services or whatever your university calls them who, who would, for example, support me and you learning how to, you know, offering training on things like, I don't know, like Microsoft Word or things like that. But those same provisions often don't exist or on a particularly clear remit of a team for students. Yeah. Um, and I remember when all this started, Leanne and I were talking in one session and it might have even been a meeting about a session and we were saying, you know, it's probably going to be new roles, new careers that we don't even think or that aren't widely seen at the moment um, of, of, you know, sort of, I guess, IT support staff for students and more of that being available because it isn't something that we have at our university. It's not something I've seen at any other university I've worked at before or anything that I've really seen across the sector. If anybody's got something like that, that where there's a specific team that teaches students how to use the softwares that they're going to use during their, their programs, you know, the sort of general, more, more expected ones, then please do let us know in the chat or put your hand up. Um, a digital yeah, engagement I... team from Sarah. Where's that, Sarah? <clears throat> yeah, I was having a look at the discovery tool. Um, the that it's, it's good um, that the question set in, in that, so it's well worth checking out. Um, there's the Uni AI Centre as well that's on the Menti, so that seems like a similar mm. thing, Chris. I think that would be interesting to know more about. Um, I'm just going to move, move us on. Um, so what kind of support is available at your institution that you're aware of um so i'm thinking are there workshops is there guidance is there a policy is a universities um or, or colleges if if you're from that sector what kind of things are available at the minute for developing critical ai literacy i'd like to be um more aware of the different kinds of things that are happening and this is the last question by the way before we move to the breakout room discussions so um you'll have a chance to to chat with some other people about the pros and cons of of these types of support as well I think um, just to pick up on Alicia's Alicia's point, that sounds amazing, and, and we definitely do have a lot of um, student-facing support, like like tons of, of it. But it's um, for different things. So different teams will will kind of look after different things, and then sometimes things come on the on the landscape that weren't there before, and it's like, oh, who? who who does that? And it's not really clear for the students, but it's just, I think, because we're a big organization, and it's a big institution, yeah. so it, it's tricky. I, I think completely I... agree with what Avril said there. Very fortunate to have that. It's such a good, good idea of doing it. Um, mm. Yeah. Oh, a dedicated AI hub. Sorry, wow. Catherine, go on. I just got, I got, I got a public sidetrack. That sounds amazing. <laughs> No, I was just saying, wow, um, some of these um, these things in the chat and um, on here just look amazing. Um, I would um, just voice the, uh, the idea that obviously um, there are um, 
the kind of resources and support that's available and created specifically for the institution. Um, I particularly um, found it really helpful curating existing support, whether from LinkedIn Learning um, courses on, there's some really great courses on there because they partnered with Microsoft now in terms of the Cold Pilot. Um, I've uh, really um, found those useful as well. Yeah. Yeah, they get certification as well for doing that one as as, as well, don't you? So that's quite we nice. It's good extra for that. Oh, people are doing some really exciting stuff. That's great. We can we can steal a lot of this. That's great. <laughs> well, I think that's that's the point of today's session, isn't yeah. it? Just to know what the possibilities are in this space and to help each other with that. Um, I'm going to just just move on to the the next thing. But if you if you if you want to share something about this, please do continue sharing in the chat. I just want to make sure we have enough time to do breakout rooms. So what we'd like to do is to ask you to think about the professional development opportunities. I mean, it's the kind of thing that we was putting on the last slide. So those for the, for, the, for the staff and those for the students to support the use of generative AI and the critical um, AI literacy that's associated. And the question is, what works? What doesn't work? You're going to have 10 minutes to discuss that. While you're doing that, just keep the tab with the mentee open because there'll be a timer on there. So that'll tell you how long you will have left for the discussion. Make sure to nominate someone to share your um, the, the key theme that comes out of your discussion on return to the room. So I'm going to hand over to Chris, who's going to put you into breakout rooms. And uh, we will see you <laughs> in about 10 minutes. Yeah. So we'll be back just after we'll be back at 46. So be aware of that. OK, and we'll see you, yeah. see you shortly. I'm just going to move some people around, Leanne, because as as tends to happen, as soon as we ask people to go into breakout room, a number of people have, have moved off. Yeah, so I'm just going to move some people around. No worries. Yeah, but I think there's um, some connectivity issues as well. So I've seen people coming in and out. So Sarah's um, just returned and needs to go to a room, Chris. Oh, no, don't worry. Honestly, I was having problems just at the start of the session. That's why I'm Leanne number three. <laughs> well, we had a minor panic that you wouldn't be able to hear anything, Leanne. <laughs> I had a, a big panic. I'm glad that it was all sorted. <laughs> I'm sure you would have been fine, though, without me. Well, I'm not sure. We want to again. Oh, we want we're to there you. now. I'm going to um, I'm just going to stop the recording so it doesn't have quite so much of us chatting. Okay. It's all at the moment. Yeah. And that that's the point isn't it is there's a there's a sort of expectation at, in certain parts of the sector that we're at the end of this and we should have answers and we should have examples and we should, the answer is 42 <laughs> and we should we should know stuff by now but actually you can't you can't know anything with absolute certainty after just over 12 months of, of it being in existence, you know, for most people. And I think that's what we've tried to to kind of um, really push with in our interactions with staff at Manchester Met. It's just a bit of patience. And, and luckily, we've been backed by the university on that. The university hasn't until very recently really started saying we need to start gathering good practice examples of this. Um, it really was, you've got 
a good 12 months or so to explore this. There's no expectation that it'll be everywhere. And I think we were quite lucky in that regard, quite fortunate to have an institution that had a sort of, let's wait and see, spend your time getting used to it sort of approach. Thanks for that, Rod. Really appreciate that, buddy. Um, anybody else got anything they'd like to share for us? We had, I think we had six groups in the end. Um, so let's hear from one of the others. Hey, Andy L, thank you. And then I'll come to Alicia after. Hey, uh, um, we were, there was only two unis represented in our uh, group. Um, so we have quite a direct comparison. Um, so we were just chatting about, like you were saying, the, the provision available for staff training. Mm. Um, and we were just talking about the way that um, we've approached it at Man Met, you know, talking staff, working with them, trying to encourage them to actually engage with it, but also having co-pilot um, uh, as part of our offering, um, which was is obviously huge. Um, and it gives us something that we can rely on that um students and staff don't have to use private emails to sign in with and all that sort of yeah. thing so it's that that works in a sort of safety net kind of good way of using stuff but then um uh, phil was saying they don't have that so he's looking at how to approach it from um an accessibility point of view and and how to sort of safely ask students if they can access stuff or staff yeah. out, so use things and it's how complicated that is well i think we we were again quite lucky that until co copilot or bing chat whatever it's called was was available to us we were able to say to colleagues and to students that you don't have to use this you're okay for a bit you know um and you certainly can't force people to use this because it's not something that you know you'd have to force them to give away personal information to an unvetted company kind of thing so yeah it's a tricky one to manage if you haven't got copilot Cheers, Andy. I'm going to just swap over to Alicia now. Thanks for waiting patiently, Alicia. Oh, it's all right. Um, a couple of um, themes from our group were, um, you know, cross institutional or cross departmental working groups coming up with guidance together. Yeah. And then perhaps um, some of that being led by academic study skills who are able to sort of give advice around when to use or not use it. Um, talk a little bit about the limitations. It was interesting that two of the universities um, are just starting with workshops for students. Yeah. Um, and I think Nicola said at MMU that was sort of um, talking to students about what they'd already done and then trying to draw out the pros and cons and then reflect on the ethics and the bias and, and that side of things and letting, letting yeah. the students lead the discussion. Um, and I think it was Sarah at, um, John Moore's said they just started out with them um, with workshops as well, but they've got some online advice. So, so yeah. it was quite reassuring that we all seem to be in a similar position, really. And like you said, in a way that the fact that we have actually got a tool now <laughs> that everybody's got, if you've got your Microsoft subscription, you can at least all get to that because that's been one yeah. of the issues, isn't it? That equity side of things. You don't really want to go in and tell everyone about these wonderful tools that, OK, we, we're not actually paying for you to get onto them. On the other hand, um, what we started to say in our group, and then we were when we came back, was you know really um, the best examples at, at Wrexham at least of, of this happening is it's when the, it's been led by academic colleagues who are yeah. linking it to what's happening in the industry that students are looking to get into. So yeah. the, we've had examples that we've shared more widely that have come from engineering and um, forensic science and design in particular. So that, that's been really interesting and it, you know, it, but you're then relying on the academics to, to be on top of that. Hopefully most of them are, <laughs> but um, that's, yeah. that's a good way to engage the students with it. And then they're thinking about, you know, what, what would be appropriate in, in that field. Fab. I guess. That's great. Yeah. Thank you so much for sharing that. Really appreciate it. We've, we've been doing, um, we've got a scheme which is like an innovation scholarship scheme. So people have had a bit of a, um, a budget to, to, to do a project in this space. So they're ongoing. And we are starting to see some really interesting examples of, of people who have approached it. Um, I heard a really interesting example from 
um, interior design and using it for, for the creative process, a bit like one aspect of the collage instead of the, the tool that you use. It's just one tool out of many to kind of think about things differently and, and try different things out. So um, I think over the next um, year, we'll, we'll see some really exciting examples of, of, of how it can be used. So it's, it's a, yeah. an exciting time, I think. And I think one of the things we want to do from this is to try and sort of pull together, like Leanne said at the very beginning, a kind of PDF or, or something of, of the responses that have, have come through today. Because I think it is, like Alicia was saying before, it's, it's good to know that we're all sort of in the same place, yeah. largely, either in kind of ethos and approach or actual progress or with things in place. I think it's really good to know that because sometimes when you're one of the people who who is finding themselves in one of these working groups on this stuff it can feel a very put upon responsible position that you have to come up with answers for something that we don't have answers for yet and and i think sometimes people imagine that other universities are much further along than perhaps they are um there are loads of bits like i said that i think we should completely steal at manchester met from today um but it's good to know that we're all roundabout in the same place I would yeah, definitely yeah. agree with that, Chris. Um, uh, I was just saying um, during the breakout groups that I feel like I want to visit about um, at least three or four universities now to uh, see how you do things. So apologies if uh, anybody gets an email from me asking if I can uh, come and learn from you, because I think some of the things that you all are doing is fantastic. So thank you for coming. Yeah, there's a good chance you will get cold called by by us three at some point <laughs> over the next over the next sort of few months uh, <laughs> for, with with a help subject in an email. Um, I've I've just switched over to the the final slide just because I'm conscious that as we approach the hour, people might need to start dropping off there, yeah. um, and I want to just hand over um to to Ian or whoever is hosting us today. I think Rod's um, going to see us out. Oh, I, well, I okay. am. Rod, to wrap things up, so I'll stop sharing my screen and um, hand over to Rod. Thank, thank you very much, Leanne. Uh, my, my first things first, I would just like to thank Chris, uh, Catherine, and Le Leanne for a really fantastic session. Really interactive and engaging. Lots of opportunities for colleagues to share uh, their experiences and to ask questions. So. Thank, thank, thank you very much uh, to all of you. It's very, very much appreciated. Um, I would just, just like again, again, in, just in terms of the the, the future stuff for the alt sig, uh, Leanne and uh, Chris and Catherine uh, shared a blog post um, in advance of this webinar as a little kind of taster and a little prompt. Um, if there's anybody out there, it doesn't have to be about AI, but anything that is related to active learning. I'll just put a couple of example posts into the uh, um, in, 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 into the chat. If anyone is interested in doing a webinar, uh, making a blog post, uh, or any kind of contribution to the active learning, so please just reach out. Uh, we'd we'd love to hear from you. So, um, Chris, can I just ask you to 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 stop the recording? Yeah, of course, mate.